what we're going to do today, the members of the DIAS ITA team are going to give you a bit of a flavour of the research that we're doing in this new programme that started a year ago. Um, we're a, a collaborative consortium led by IBM on both the uh, US side and the UK side of the Atlantic. Um, we've got 16 partners that I'll briefly introduce in a moment. And the theme of this new program is distributed analytics and information science. Um, put those two together, it's not just about doing data analytics, it's about doing them in, in a distributed context, but to generate information, actionable information. So we're looking to make a, a, a marker in this area. Um, if we play our cards right, we could go for uh, 10 years for a total of $80 million budget, so we could be wrapping this up in 2026. There's a major midterm review in four years' time, so that's what we're, uh, I guess, working towards, but it's a terrific opportunity to do um, long-term research. Um, for those of you who study the impact agenda, it's quite nice because the core project is doing basic research, but we have additional uh, available opportunities to do technology transition, so it's a sort of research and impact machine. And um, for those who are familiar with our previous ITA that um, I led Cardiff's bit, the network and information science in this ITA, um, it's not a direct continuation of that. It was a new call. Um, it just so happened that the bid led by RBM was, uh, was, the, was the preferred bid. Um, two thirds of the consortium members are previous NIS ITAs, but we've got new people. So this is the team. Um, on the US side, just to get the West East thing going, um, well, you can see there, I won't, I won't read them all out. UCLA were in before, Stanford are new, Turkey were new, Penn State on the West Coast, um, the government scientists, the Army Research Lab in the US and DSTL in the UK are fully fledged members of the consortium. They're not kind of just sponsors or, or, or um, people doing applications, they're scientists working as part of the team. Um, IBM in the US part are based on their um, East Coast um, Watson lab and in the UK it's the team down um, near Winchester at Hursley Park. UK universities, US, Imperial, UCL and Southampton. Yeah. I'm not going to go through all of this but we are a small part of a much bigger enterprise, that 80 million budget covers at the moment two technical areas, six projects. Moving west over here. All this stuff I'm not going to talk about at all, but is uh, half the project is looking at computer networking stuff, more the sort of thing that can, goes on downstairs in, in engineering, though we do a little bit of it here. Um, but the stuff here, looking at software-defined networking in, a, in our particular context, putting services together, moving data around to support distributed analytics, all governed by security policies, that enables our part of the project to do stuff. What sort of stuff? Well, performing of high-level analytics and looking at two particular problems, understanding human systems, groups interacting, both in cyberspace and physical space, and the connection between cyber and physical spaces. And then down here in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the problem of anticipatory situational understanding. So get an understanding of some happening situation and try to anticipate what might happen next. So that bit down there is the project we're going to talk about today. Cardiff, by the way, is involved in all three of these. Roger Whittaker leads a team in evolution of complex adaptive. Uh, Ian Taylor leads a team in instinctive analytics, and uh, I'm leading the uh, business project. Uh, call it Project 6. And uh, effectively, what we're trying to do is to get humans and machines working together on situational understanding problems. This is all terribly abstract, but Dan and then Federico will make it concrete. We are particularly interested in how various approaches coming from machine learning, pattern recognition, feed it into the knowledge level. So to provide, you know, a kind of information theoretic, information scientific understanding of the uh, real world situations. 
Um, nowadays, everybody's interested in deep learning. Will they still be in 10 years' time? Well, you know, it probably will have moved on by then. But at the moment, there are urgent problems involved in trying to make use of um, deep learning techniques in this kind of context, which Dan is, uh, is going to give you uh, a demonstration of. Uh, but we're interested in temporal, distributed, and particularly in uh, interpretable deep learning. I produced this slide a couple of weeks ago for our annual, our first annual project meeting. At that project meeting, various people presented papers, and Federico, in about 20 minutes' time, will give you a rerun of the paper he presented. It was in London, in North London, a couple of weeks ago. We also, at our annual meetings, like to produce demos that illustrate the concepts that we're working on, demos that are vehicles to get the research in a form that um, kind of you know, stakeholders can, 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 can appreciate. Um, Dan coordinated a, a, a demo which went down very well, was actually highlighted as one of the um, th three highlight demos from the program in terms of how it communicated the science to, uh, we had 120 people from the project at the meeting and probably something like 20 external visitors as well and they appreciated this demo. So we're going to give it again today in the hope that uh, colleagues here will appreciate. And now I hand the floor to Dan. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm just going to grab this one. This is the pause when you can edit me out. Yeah, I'm also going to have to edit grabbing the poster out because I uh, oh, yeah. hadn't, done, hadn't done that ahead of time. Uh, and it can be very So, yeah, so as Alan was saying, uh, this demo was presented uh, to our colleagues and some external uh, military personnel a couple of weeks ago. Um, so in that light, in that light, um, there was sort of a scenario that went along with that, which was that there's a city under coalition control uh, similar to what you might find in a relief effort uh, during a disaster scenario, where we've got a UK uh, sort of controlled zone and a US controlled zone, and there's some kind of military convoy that's got to get across the city. And we're going to look at how a sort of uh, human agent uh, can receive decision support using some form of interface. Um, and the key things we're going to look at come from our P6 sort of uh, interests, which is firstly sort of a, a low-level entity to high-level threat uh, sort of reasoning and understanding. Um, we're going to look at the interpretability of uh, both the machine learning and the sort of uh, service chain parts of the system, uh, which is obviously becoming a, a big important research area. Um, and then finally we look at the coalition constraints and how they affect uh, those two factors. Um, so this is kind of the big map, so as you see there's the two, two checkpoints, Alpha and Bravo, controlled by the British, and, ooh, and uh, two by the US. So, um, the two systems we're going to look at are present at each checkpoint. Um, so first of all we've got sort of a very simple end-to-end -end solution involving a uh, convolution, convolutional neural network, so the sort of deep learning approach, uh, which you can see on the left here. So we're taking in uh, camera imagery, uh, passing it to a congestion classifier. It will say whether the, uh, the location is congested or not, uh, and that will form part of the s system's uh, situational awareness. On the right-hand side, we've got a uh, more complex sort of service chain approach, where we're identifying low-level entities like cars, um, and the traffic flow at a particular location, and we're performing some fusion on that information, uh, comparing it to uh, a speed limit, which we can get from uh, sort of OpenStreetMap API or other sort of source, and we just use a simple rules-based uh, classifier to say, comparatively, how is the traffic moving to the speed limit, uh, and then making some sort of uh, assessment of whether the location has uh, congestion or not. So 
in practice, that feeds into uh, this interface. So this is a prototype for the demo. Um, so first of all, apologies for the styling. Uh, but secondly, we're actually using uh, some pre-generated output um, in sort of to produce the, the conversational aspect. Um, we do have other work that does look at this conversational side and um, we've shown that this kind of thing is possible uh, previously um, in both NIS and in some of the stuff we've been doing uh, in this project. But uh, for today, that's not sort of what we'll be showcasing. It's more just an illustration. Um, so as the, pers the decision maker uh, for this convoy and uh, the logistics behind it, um, uh, the question we might ask this in interface is, is the route between checkpoint A and, to, and checkpoint D congested? So when we first ask that, we might get a simple high level conclusion. Yeah, the route's congested, which might be enough, but probably won't be. Um, so we can drill down into some of the reasoning behind uh, why the system thinks this. So if we drill down one level, we just get a simple explanation of, well, A is think, uh, thought as is congested, B is congested, C and D are not congested. Um, and we also notice here that checkpoint B has been flagged, uh, which we'll look at in uh, a little bit. But first we'll delve into checkpoint A, because it's a, a sort of more straightforward example. We see uh, the interface can sort of propose the uh, services that were used to uh, generate this conclusion. Uh, so we've got our congestion classifier, which is that machine learning uh, CNN approach. And we've got the congestion reasoner, which is that uh, service composition approach. And then if we want to delve into why they are saying their various conclusions, uh, we can look at the explanations offered by the services. And this is where the primary thrust of our research has taken place um, in terms of generating these uh, explainable services and, and, and indeed ex the explainability of the system itself. So most uh, classifiers will, will give you a probability uh, for its decision, so nothing yet new there, but we do present it in the interface. Um, but the first interesting idea is this saliency map. So uh, here we have the original input image on the left and the portion of the image that the CNN actually used uh, for its classification on the right. But over the top of that is uh, a saliency map. So here we see that the regions that were most uh, relevant for either the label of congestion or not congested are highlighted. So green is the uh, sort of uh, evidence towards uh, not congestion, uh, not congested, and red is the evidence towards congestion. So we can see here that um, where this big pocket of cars uh, is, there's, there's the red, uh, there's some open space here, and that's sort of highlighted in green. Uh, these cars are starting to bunch up, that's in red. And from this, we sort of start getting um, some confidence that maybe the, the system's actually looking at the right things within the image. Um, and this is an example of uh, transparency. So we've been, within our research, we've been looking at sort of two forms of interpretability. Uh, and the first one is indeed transparency. And this refers to looking directly at the signals that went into the decisions being made. So uh, here we've got the input image and we're looking directly at the parts of the input image that traveled through the machine learning model and uh, contributed to that decision. Alternatively, the second uh, sort of form of interpretability we've been looking at is called post hoc interpretability. And this is where um, rather than directly looking at signals that, that sort of produce that decision, we can provide uh, some kind of justification, which may or may not come from those signals, um, to sort of help give confidence, to help explain the decision. Um, so here, uh, what's taking place is these, the, the, the parts of the image that were relevant uh, have been masked off and only those parts have been sent to an object detector. And we've looked for semantically relevant objects within those parts. So things that we think are sensible to look at when you're looking for congestion. So, for example, cars. So 
we've detected cars and, and roads in this uh, in this sort of sailing map. So now we can say, well, not only does it, not only a human can look at this and say, oh, it looks like it's looking at the right things. Now we've got this list that sort of says, well, cars are semantically relevant to congestion, and we've detected them in those regions. So it looks like maybe it's looking at the right things. And then finally, we have a second example of post hoc explanation. And this is what we call the congestometer um, and has been sort of generated by using the original input image, um, the rating of congestion for that input image, and then looking back into the training data for uh, examples in the training data that are slightly less congested and slightly more congested. Uh, so less is on the left and more congested on, is on the right. And this kind of gives uh, the human agent looking at this the impression of well, what, what, does, what does the model think congestion looks like? Um, so that can be useful for building confidence uh, in the model and understanding the uh, classifications that are coming out. If we look at the service, the, 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 the reason service, we can have a look at the explanations offered there. Um, and here we sort of get uh, explanations in the form of the components that went into the decision. So, um, first of all, we get that traffic flow to speed limit rating. Um, and then we also get the rule uh, that was used to turn that rating into an actual classification. So we can see here that uh, the rule was if the traffic flow rating is less than 0.4, it's congested. And if we go back here, we see it was 0.3. And we also, along with this explanation, get some indication of the trend of that rating. So 0.3 is, is, is sort of a low movement. Um, so we get some kind of understanding of the data that uh, this service was working with. Um, so again, we can build confidence and, and further understand that decision. Um, and this, that sort of uh, uh, overview of what's going on, um, but this gets interesting if we take a look at checkpoint B, where we see the explanation of how this congested conclusion was drawn. We actually see that the two services are actually in disagreement. And we can see that uh, that's noted here, and it sort of gives us a reason. Well, first of all, how did you even decide between the two services? And here it just highlights that actually the classifier has a re high reported accuracy, so that's the one it went with. And if we delve into that uh, sort of classifier, we can take a look at the saliency map and try to understand uh, what's going on, whether we should trust uh, how the system sort of ended its uh, sort of summary. And we look at the input image and we sort of can clearly see as a human, it doesn't look that congested. And if we take a look at the saliency map, we start to see why this can be quite useful. So looking at these regions, none of them are really focused on cars, they're focused on the tree line. And that doesn't sound right when you're looking at congestion. So as an aside, as sort of the, within, we engineered and trained the, the, um, the model, the CNN model, we know that this location wasn't part of the training data uh, that was used to train the model. Um, and we also know there weren't actually any very any clear examples of tree lines or dense trees within the imagery that was used to train it. So we actually can see here that this sort of saliency map is not only giving maybe a decision uh, maker uh, who might not have any sort of machine learning knowledge, they can already see that maybe this shouldn't be trusted, but perhaps this can give insights to the uh, machine learning engineers who can say, well, actually, there's a shortfall in our, in our training data. We need to uh, go back. We need to find better examples, and, and we can actually target our examples to counteract uh, the, the, the sort of maltraining that, that, that was experienced here. Um, so now, as a human, We've seen evidence that says perhaps this uh, classifier can't be trusted in this example. But we want to kind of reduce the amount of time the decision makers are, are having to spend filtering through all this data. So here we've got a simple route of four nodes. That's going to be quite time consuming if it goes to 10, 20 nodes, something like that. Instead, we want something that can be automatically checked by the system and then produce uh, a flag like you see here, but that's not very easy to do for the, for the system just from that saliency map. But 
this is where our sort of post hoc explanation comes in. So this was easy to the, the, the post hoc semantic list is easy to generate um, by just chaining together the right services, passing that saliency map to an object detector and looking for uh, semantically relevant items. And when that list is empty, we don't know that something's gone wrong, but we certainly want to highlight that to the user. So here we see that there's the, the, the list is empty, so hasn't been looking at cars, like in checkpoint A. So probably want to flag that and have a human take a look. And indeed, the human can come in, have a look, see that possibly that's, well, almost certainly that's not doing what it's supposed to be. And in fact, the human agent can report that. Um, and in, as I was mentioning, the engineers can then take that information and perhaps uh, retrain that service. But now in terms of decision support, we need to uh, have some evidence uh, to, to actually change uh, this classification in our minds, have some confidence that it is indeed not congested. So if we go to the reasoner and we have a look at uh, the, the rating, we can see that indeed there's a high level of movement, which again supports the fact that the area is probably not congested. So now going forward, if we've got to make logistical decisions, um, some of that interpretability, those explanations, have actually helped us uh, have confidence that we should ignore the system suggestion of congestion and we should go with a, uh, a thought that it's actually not congested. And then moving on, uh, we have sort of some examples of the impact that the uh, coalition uh, information flow constraints can have on a system like this and how, how can we uh, work around them. If you remember, checkpoint C is under US control and if we scroll to the top here, we're actually logged in as a British agent. So if we try and look, you know, we want, we want some more confidence in this decision. We've just had a bad one from B. So let's take a look at the saliency map. Unfortunately, the image has been redacted. So here at checkpoint C, um, there's a camera that you can use for monitoring the traffic, but the location is deemed classified. Now, if the image was circulated to the, to the British side um, of the coalition, you could infer the location of the camera simply looking at the uh, angle and so on of the imagery. So once the sort of results are leaving the US system, the system has a policy in place to remove any uh, sensitive imagery. So indeed, we've got no saliency map. And now, if we just had saliency map as an explanation, we wouldn't be able to build up our confidence in the classification we're getting. This, again, is where post hoc explanation comes in. So we can look at, at the US side, we can take that uh, saliency map, we can still pass it to a object detector, and we can generate our list of semantically relevant objects. So here we've got a list, it's got car and road in it, and nothing about this list reveals the location of the camera, but we still have some explanation to give us that confidence uh, in that classification. And indeed, with our explanation by example, um, we don't have the input image again, but we do have our examples from the training data. Um, Perhaps these examples come from specifically a part of the training data that isn't classified. And again, we're able to um, have some confidence here. In addition to sort of this uh, privacy aspect, some information flow constraints can come in the form of uh, the capabilities uh, of the devices or perhaps uh, bandwidth limitations. So for example, if you've got a human agent in the tactical edge within the, in the field, and he has a device that isn't able to display imagery, we're still able to send them not only a classification for the area, but we can send them reasoning behind that in a modality that his device can accept. And similarly, uh, textual-based stuff uh, takes up less bandwidth and can adhere to that. And so finally, um, I will just show uh, the live version of what of the services. So for those who haven't used Node-RED before, this might look slightly uh, confusing at first, 
but if we look at the bottom here, we can see that this is the sort of optical flow chain that's taking, that's identifying the flow of traffic, um, passing it to, uh, combining it with the speed limit. In the middle here, we've got our CNN that's passing that to, uh, passing the saliency map to the car detector, and we're getting our salient objects list. And up here, we've got some of the, the imagery. And what this sort of shows is, it's very easy if we had a different uh, CNN, uh, sort of a different uh, explainability technique, interpretability technique, we can actually just plug it in and connect it up quite nicely. And this is a big part of what we've been doing in terms of our prototy prototyping and exploring uh, the research um, so far is this sort of tool makes it very easy to set these service chains up and have a look at uh, the results we're getting. And then we get sort of a live sort of dashboard. Uh, let me just populate the full list of cameras. And we can take a look at, say, Finchley Road, um, where this is just around the corner from where the uh, meeting took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, and in theory, we should start getting, so there we go. So we start getting uh, the data coming through from all the different services. We've got our congestion rating from the CNN and its saliency map. We've got our left sort of a lower congestion example and a higher congestion example. Um, we've got our mast imagery. Uh, we've got objects detected there. And I think optical flow should be coming. Uh, I was playing around with this earlier, so there's a chance that I uh, broke the service chain. But in any case. Uh, that's sort of the live example of, of connecting things up. And I think that's everything I was going to cover there. So does it, anyone have any questions?